Welcome to NetSmart Care Threads, a podcast where human services and post-acute leaders across the healthcare continuum come together to discuss industry trends, challenges, and opportunities. Listen as we uncover real stories about how to innovate and improve the quality of care for the communities we serve. Let's get into the show. My name is Mike Valentine. I'm the CEO for NetSmart, and I'm the host of the uh, podcast this morning for NetSmart Care Threads. And I have a, a really interesting, cool story to engage with today. And uh, I've asked Tony Pergolan to uh, join us from uh, Bancroft. And um, uh, that Bancroft is uh, on the human services part of healthcare and has a long legacy of serving individuals with IDD, autism, and now getting into other service lines as well that we'll let Tony talk about. So welcome, Tony. Why don't you uh, start off with just give a little bit of background on on uh, yourself and on Bancroft. Sure. Well, um, thanks for having me today. I'm happy to be here uh, to talk about Bancroft as always. Uh, as you said, I'm the CEO of Bancroft. I've been here for 18 years now, and I'm really excited to be celebrating 140 years of changing lives for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, autism, and brain injuries. We serve about 2,000 individuals today in 250 group homes, four schools, two campuses, 14 facilities for day program, outpatient space, and admin. We have about 2,800 extremely dedicated staff members. That's awesome. That's awesome. So um, one of the things that was fascinating to me about the story of Bancroft and, and you personally is um, the fact that there's this legacy organization that's been around, you know, for a very long time. I always think that NetSmart is a, an older company because we're 54 years old. So it's a, it's a really great story uh, and one of the pioneers. But the, the, the beginning of the story 18 years ago started with you as an accountant coming into the organization when it was not in, in great shape. And, you know, all, all organizations have a history and a, they go through cycles and you were brought in to help kind of bring the, the organization forward and upward. And I think a lot of the, the, the neatness of the story is, you know, someone from the outside of healthcare coming in and an organization that has a ton of history doing unique things, kind of resetting its, its sites. And so a big part of the focus of today's conversation is how did you do it? Uh, you know, where did you start? And how do you, as an organization, think about setting strategies for yourselves historically? And then how do you see that going forward? So really great intro to, to really my, my journey, if you will, here. Um, you know, I came in from the outside, knew nothing about Bancroft, didn't understand, you know, kind of what they did or how they were funded or anything like that. Um, I came in in the middle of a financial crisis, as you said, and really just went to work from the kind of business perspective. And, you know, I, and, and I think this is an interesting fun fact. So in 140 years, I'm only the ninth president of the organization. So people have been here for a very long time. And the people before me were experts, truly geniuses in the autism field. So it put Bancroft on the map because of our treatment and how we were able to deliver care. What they didn't have was the business acumen. So while I couldn't have arrived and you know know how to establish autism treatment, like they couldn't do the business piece. So it really was, you, you have to have both, I think is, is what I learned there. So they did all that piece. And then when I came in, I really stabilized it from, from a business perspective. And you know, not rocket science, really. I mean, I've gone through a lot of turnarounds in my life. You really just, you have to know, you know what the funding stream is. You have to know what your costs are. And honestly, I would say the biggest thing we did is we got smaller before we got bigger. So we had sites in Louisiana and we had in California and in Maine, and we had to really divest them and really come back to our core, our core mission right here in New Jersey about really what we do. And once we could stabilize that and we could like make payroll without waiting for the mailman to come in every day. <laughs> We really were able to, to sit back and say, okay, now, now we're stabilized. Where are we going from here? And we were really able to plan, I think, in a much more thoughtful way when you've got the business you know, acumen in mind about growth because you, you can't do everything. 
right? We know that every company can't be everything to everybody, but what are you good at? And what's the funding model so that you're successful in it? Right. And uh, I think that the line of you got to get smaller to get bigger uh, I use that myself and I, I like the the connotation of it's all about building blocks, right? If you're not good at the foundational building blocks, then you're not going to solve the, the the other pieces. The other thing that is, I think, the best thing about being in healthcare, but it's also an Achilles heel, uh, is you've never met a caregiver that doesn't want to take on a new opportunity to care for a broader set of, of humans, right? And so there's this insatiable demand to do the next thing and the next thing and next thing. Um, doesn't always come with a, a business plan or a, a, a bottom line margin. You know, it's it's a great point. And, and, you know, it's really, there's a lot of education around that with our clinicians because, you know, like we don't get paid for that, then you can't do that, you know, but they need it. They do need it, right? So it's it's really, and I would say we work on both ends. Of course, we we work with our clinicians to understand more of the business model. We also work with our funders to say, you know, if we can do this now, it's going to save so much more later. But the funding, you know, unfortunately, in our space is not connected. So, you know, these people, the state doesn't want to have to pay for it because the insurance will pay for that when they're in the hospital. Well, that's just not good care. Right. So there's a lot of education and advocacy that that I found that we spend a lot of time with our funders. Yeah, it's definitely a journey for all of the providers in in this space. Um, Okay, so the last 18 years, you've built uh, the organization forward, stabilized it, and now are are growing through a variety of ways. When you think about your uh, strategic plan, so the next three to five years forward, what are the fundamental building blocks that you see on your horizon? When I think about, you know, a strategic plan here, which, you know, I'm a big believer in them and have, you know, done, done them every three to five years. And, you know, a little bit um, to your earlier point, a lot of it was just strengthening our foundation, right? Let's be good at what we do. But now we feel pretty, pretty strong about where we are. And we're really, you know, this next plan is much more visionary about our future. And for organizations like Bancroft, a strategic plan is much more than just an operational map. It's truly a powerful vision about changing people's lives. And we've titled this plan Changing Lives because I want everybody on the team focused on that is the whole purpose of this plan is to continue to change lives in ways we really haven't been able to do before. So four components, um, first and foremost, is um, significant growth plan. You know, every strategic plan that I do anyway is about growth because it's all about how we can not only just keep growing revenue, but how we can expand our access, right? I mean, as fast as we grow, it's not fast enough. And we get calls, you know, I'm a mom myself. So when I get these calls from moms that say, like, please help my kid, I mean, you know, I want to help their kid. So we we really are focused very differently about expanding access to care. We want to inspire clinical excellence. And by that, I mean, we want to deliver whole person care We want to be innovative in our care models, and we want to be a resource to other professionals in the field. Like, we really want to expand what we think we do really well so that, like, you don't just have to be at Bancroft to get our care. I mean, if there's other professionals out there, if there's other people who we can help benefit and learn back from, we want this to be a part of the plan. We want to be much larger than just our four walls. We want to transform the employee experience. And to me, This is probably the most important in this plan because without staff, we can't grow and we can't deliver the best care. So really knowing how we can transform their experience. And I think every company today came out of COVID recognizing that employees, they want and they need something different from their employer. And we got to, we got to step up to that. We, We really do. So, you know, for us, it's about how do we care about their whole well-being, right? How do we care about what's going on in their family life? How, how do we care about, you know, why they can't get to work on time? How, like, how do we, we worry more about just, you know, the eight hours that they're here a day? And the other piece is, how do we make their work easier? You know, how do we make sure that everything they do, everything they need from Bancroft is easy to access, right? They have their direct care. They have a hard job, but working in Bancroft shouldn't be that hard. So that's that's another focus of it. 
And then last but not least is leveraging technology. So, you know, technology, I think, is booming in every industry these days. And it's really just now entering our industry. And we want to really be the leaders of that. And we see it in a lot of different ways. We see it around, you know, person-centered technology. We see it around making work easier. And, and we see it around like just building that whole foundation of technology. So I'm excited about the future. And, you know, I'll tell you also different from last time, I've been um, on this like path of um, campaign, if you will, of talking about it everywhere I go, which is why I was so thrilled to be able to talk with you here today. But we've been out talking to community leaders. We're talking to our families about it. We're talking to our legislator about it. We're talking to our key stakeholders about it because we can't do it alone. We know we need partners in this. We need our health systems to partner with us. We need our universities to partner with us. We need our business partners, right? The people who are vendors, we, we need them. As we grow, they need to grow. So I've really been out on this kind of tour, if you will, of just talking about this. So people, like, if that's what Bancroft's doing, I'm going to do it with them. Right. I love that. I love that. It's very balanced, uh, which is is great. It's amazing to me. And I know how it happens. We all get busy. We do strategy work. Um, and then you start the hard part, which is uh, start to make it real. And we connect with a lot of organizations across the country. And it's amazing to me how few people, how few organizations can sustain a strategy that, you know, spans over multiple years because it's just, it gets hard. It's a cultural thing that, the connection to your point around evangelism and the, the strategy of everyone inside needs to know the strategy, everyone outside needs to understand the strategy and what it means to them, I think is key because if you're not doing that, it gets forgotten because the windshield activities take over and you forget about where you are really trying to drive the bus in the first place. And, you know, I feel a little accountable. Like I'm out talking about this. I'm going to say like, I'm going to meet with you and talk about it. Like now I got to do it. You know, I mean, it makes you more accountable when you start telling people <laughs> like, now I got to do this. Well, I, I have a, a, a follow on question then. So the best laid plans are, are not uh, anything unless you can actually deliver on it and execute. And so, you know, obviously you have 18 years of, of building bridges and foundations for the next era of Bancroft. How do you think about execution? You know, so you've got the fundamentals of your strategy. How do you ensure good execution against that strategy? So, you know, I, I will say I don't always get it right, but I think I learn after everyone on how to do it better. And ultimately, I think where, where we are is we always have to be evaluating, right? Like what we think are the priorities today, and, you know, we can all use the pandemic for an example, right? We were on a path and then something comes out of left field. I mean, you really do have to pause, right? Deal with the issue. But you got to learn how to come back to it. Like, here's where we were, right? We, we got to get back on that. But it's always evaluating and reevaluating what's most important today. So when we are rolling out this plan, we're really looking at what can we do next year? Like, don't worry about five years from today. Worry about of this five-year plan, what can we do next year? And let's make it, you know, small enough that we can really focus on it and get it done. Because if you're doing a little bit of a lot of things nothing really gets done and you kind of lose momentum, quite honestly. So we're now in this chunk. And, you know, I can tell you, I've learned this a few times. Um, a couple years back, we did a, um, I guess it was five years ago, we moved our flagship program was our school. It was in Hanfield, New Jersey, which is where our founder started. And after 135 years, we literally moved it to Mount Laurel. And this was huge, if, if you could imagine. And I really, for the three years ahead of that, I mean, I almost put on blinders for my organization. Like, we're not stopping this until we're there because, you know, we'd get like an opportunity. Hey, these people want to talk to you about merger. I'm like, can't do that today. Like, hey, how about this new program? Can't. There's so many ways you can get derailed. And so it was so like, I, I, everybody just keep on moving till we get this done. And now we'll take on the next thing. So I think that's a really key thing to think about is what can you accomplish in this year? And then just keep the priorities minimal to that. Right. I totally agree. Totally agree. We have this concept. Uh, you talked about breaking into smaller parts. Uh, we have this concept of big rocks. So big rocks are what do we want to accomplish in the next 90 days? 
And then we, you know, we have all company calls and we talk about the big rocks. And then every 90 days we, or every month, we give an update on where do we stand against the big rocks that we, we all signed up for. And it's a way of connecting the dots, I think, as you said, to the bigger picture. And I also think it's really helpful for the organization because when they know what the big rocks are, then they can keep their focus there too. And it's almost like if you're working on something that's not in the, is doesn't support this plan, put it aside because this is where we're going. So I think it helps clarify like the whole way down the organization on what we should be working on. Yeah. Love that. Love that. 90 days. I got, I got to think about that. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's for the exact purpose that you said is um, if someone, you know, raises an issue that's related to one of those big rocks, then you, you know, it's a priority. Um, you mentioned in your your uh, discussions earlier uh, the concept of uh, mergers acquisitions and that as a way of augmenting your growth forward. What's your view on M and A as as part of your longer view strategy? So you know, I really believe that as funding shrinks in our industry, that M and A is really one way that we can continue to provide the quality of services to those in our care. And, and across the industry. I mean, we've, I feel like our industry has been talking about this for a long time. You know, we're seeing it in the banking industry. We're seeing it in the hospital industry and, and we're just kind of talking to it. But ultimately, as funding shrinks, we have to kind of come together. And, you know, so we think about it on, you know, what are we good at, right? What do we bring to the table of a, of a merger? And, and what do we need? And I think those are two really, really important things for, for both organizations to think about. So right now, you know, really what we do best, there are, you know, really claim to fame, if you will, as really our longest histories is education. And so we've started building a school network. And what we're finding is, is that there's schools out there that are part of other larger organizations. And these other larger organizations, they don't have the focus, they don't have the resources. And so when we bring them into ours, I mean, they thrive. And now they've got peers and they've got clinicians to to talk to and to, you know, there's so much value for the employee and of course for the, the student themselves. So it's like looking for, you know, what what do we do well and, and how do we build that out? Um, and, you know, it's been interesting. We're, we're also talking to, you know, other like organizations. And one of the things I think is most important when you kind of go through this is to really understand what you have to give up when you're ready to do this, you know, and we've gotten through pretty close to some organizations and, and then they're like, Oh, oh, oh no, 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 I, I, I'm not ready for that. You know? So which is fair, but I mean, it's really been a, a journey and a learning process, you know, and I also think timing is important as well. Like, you know, we really are connecting with organizations where, you know, that maybe their CEO is retiring. The board is like, we want to retire. We've kind of been doing this for a while. And, and I would really suggest that an m and is an option that should be considered at those kind of key timing issues before you start all over again. It doesn't make sense to really look at combining some of this. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're going to see more and more uh, consolidation. Uh, you see it in spades in the acute care world that um, it's like every, every week there's another uh, almost mega merger. And that impacts the rest, it has downstream effects to the, the rest of healthcare. Uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot now. You mentioned technology as one of your uh, strategic pillars. And obviously we're biased on that topic and agree with you. But um, what, what, are, what are the kinds of technologies that, that you're thinking of? You, you touched on them briefly before, but what, what kinds of things do you see playing a role in driving efficiencies or you know, clinical care, et cetera? Right. So, you know, we've, we've laid out this technology plan in, um, in, in a few sections. So first is person-centered technology. And these are things like smart homes, right? So you think about, um, you know, for the individuals we serve, like faucets that, on, that come on automatically, uh, stoves that shut off automatically in case somebody forgets it, right? The refrigerator that takes the inventory of what's in there and spits out the shopping list, right? So there's all those things that a lot of people are already living with that we really think can help the skill building piece of the people we serve. We're also partnering with tech companies, which has been really interesting that they come to us and say, we want to be in your space. And we're looking at virtual reality for skill building for the people we serve. We're looking at skill building training for the um, for our staff. So I think there's a lot of 
um, virtual reality coming out there and also assistive technology. I mean, you know, I, I would say 75% of the people we serve are nonverbal. So to be able to give them a voice in some way, it's just huge, right, for quality of life. So that's person-centered. We're looking at um, technology to make work easier. So we are um, in the middle of a new payroll system implementation, which is kind of the the big rock, if you will, <laughs> for this year. Let's just get this in. But it'll allow people to self-schedule and it'll allow people to check their payroll and get paid even before payday, like all those types of things. Again, for the employee, we're looking at a new health record, a new EHR, um, which will be critical. Uh, you know, it, it, it really is kind of the main system of the organization. So that'll help the overall and then and then virtual reality, as I said. And then hardened business resilience. And this is stuff like cybersecurity, right? I mean, we all got to be focused on these things now. The business continuity plan. What happens when all this goes down? So, you know, th- those are kind of the main buckets. But but again, I really think that this is really an important initiative for our industry and certainly at Bancroft. But as we talked about before, we have to do it in a way that the organization can embrace like capacity to learn this. I mean, this, you know, technology, I've really realized is, is not just putting a new system in. You need a whole different skill set. To maximize these systems, you need change management so people understand what you're doing. I mean, it is more than just put a new system in. And so it's really understanding from a capacity perspective in the organization, the timing and how many we can deal at one time. But I'm excited about it because I think it'll be a game changer in our in our industry once we're done in, at Bancroft. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I think your ability to link technology to the impact you want A lot of people go into it thinking, okay, I need this, you know, billing system or payroll system because my old one's sleepy, but really I need to connect the dots to what are you trying to do? You know, I'm trying to engage your, you know, employees in a different way. You're trying to impact care. I think being able to connect those dots allows you to build a more powerful strategy um, than just I'm checking the boxes across the enterprise. We spend a lot of time uh, trying to connect those dots. For our clients. So, and I, you know, I've been doing this at NetSmart for a little over 12 years now, and the industry has come a long way. Uh, no one would ever have answered the question like you just did. They basically said, I need a new billing system. And if I get an electronic health record, okay, that's the holy grail. And then I'm, you know, I'm kind of done. And now I'm trying to engage employees and consumers. <laughs> And right. It, it, it's a whole different, it's a whole different, you know, initiative now, but, but critically important. Great. Great. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to pivot. Uh, so you're an author. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, many people, you know, throughout their careers go through this phase of people telling them, oh, that's such a great story. You should write a book. And you actually listen to them. Uh, <laughs> and, so, and I love the concept of your book. So why don't you share with uh, everyone your, your story of how you got to writing the book and, and the purpose of the book? So, yeah, I, a lot of people told me, uh, you know, you should write a book, you should write a book. And, and I was really against it. Like, number one, I'm an accountant. So I deal with numbers, not words. Right. So I was like, can't, it's not going to work for me. Um, but, you know, the more people talk to me and said, you know, it's more than just a turnaround story because turnarounds happen every day. That's what CFOs do. You know, so I'm like, this is just a turnaround. But they really made me realize that, you know, it doesn't always happen in a in 140 year old organization. Right. And so for me, you know, what, what finally got me to, to writing it, and, and I would say it, it, it was hard and, and there's not going to be a sequel. So um, I, you know, <laughs> get it and, and be done with it. Um, but, uh, you know, a few reasons that really connected with me is, you know, for sure, you know, there are always lessons to be learned uh, about turnarounds. And I think that as leaders, I mean, I'm always reading other people's, you know, um, experiences because we all learn from them. So, so for sure, I wanted to, to share that, how to build a sustainable organization. But the other pieces that I think really um, motivated me was I, I got the opportunity to educate the average person on the importance of nonprofits in their community and just how vulnerable they are. Like, I really don't believe people understood it. And like, I would tell my friends, like, oh, I'm a CEO of a, of a nonprofit. And they'd be like, Oh, that's so nice. You don't even have to make money. And I was like, what? (laughs) So I I, I took this opportunity to say, you know, nonprofits are an important part of your community. You use them, you work at them, you sit on their boards, like you need them. By the way, 
they're all operating on a shoestring. So, so like you need to know that you need to know how to help them. And the last point was about um, board members. You know, people think, oh, it's great to sit on a board. I really like to talk to people about it's a responsibility to sit on a board, right? You sit on a board, the, the organization does good, that's due to you. The organization does bad, that's due to you too. So, you know, so there, there was a lot more, you know, just about the turnaround. And, you know, finally, it really was a way to talk about Bancroft. I mean, you know, when I came here, I came to do a turnaround and I knew nothing about this organization. And as I got out, started meeting the individuals and the parents and the staff, I mean, I was just really just blown away by the mission of this organization. And so in the book, there's a lot of stories told by families because how we change families' lives is the most powerful way to talk about this organization. So from that part, I, I, I got through it. And and, I, and in the end, I'm, I'm glad I did it. <laughs> Great. It's a fantastic story. I don't know what the record for the most number of pages written by a former CFO. <laughs> So it'd be interesting to, to see if you, you got there. Um, so the book's name is Too Important to Fail, Leadership Lessons for Nonprofits. I encourage everyone to, to check it out. Um, I've got a follow on question because your story is a fascinating one. Um, so at NetSmart, the majority of our associates are women. I love that. And that's rare for a technology company uh, in the Midwest uh, and, and across the country. So and we're super proud of that. And um, we focus a lot on leadership development amongst women because, uh, the, you know, you're very aware that once you get up into the ranks, the leadership percentage drops off dramatically between men and women. It's something like 35 percent women, uh, even in the same mix of population. And so, you know, at, at Netsmart, we feel like we're blessed with strong women leaders. What advice would you have for women leaders across the country? You know, what, what's worked for you in your career? And if you had one or two nuggets that you would share of hopping into a situation like this and being successful over a long haul, what two or three nuggets of advice would you share? I would say that um, a, a, a couple things, you know, I never really looked at, you know, my what, what I brought to any job I was at was because of my gender. You know, I brought my experience and I brought, you know, what I have learned over the years. And so I just, I, I never, I never allowed myself to be looked at any differently than just a, a person who is smart and knows how to do this, right? So it's, it's you know, you have to not, not look for, I should be treated differently. And am I being treated differently? I just came in and, and did what was needed to do. And again, I, you know, I think I brought value, right? Are you bringing value? Are you learning and growing? And just not being hesitant about, you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm the only woman around the table. I'm often the only woman around the table. It doesn't bother me one iota, right? I'm there for, because I'm, I, I bring value. So it's almost like be confident in yourself and be confident in who you are. And, you know, finally, I'm always asked about, you know, how do you balance you know, work-life balance as a mom. I had two, you know, two sons who are, you know, were in daycare and had a, had a CEO as a mom and they're perfectly fine. So they survived. But, you know, and, and I would always say, like, I never looked at like, oh, I, you know, I, am I spending too much time here or too much time there? I was where I needed to be at the time. So when my kids needed me and something was going on at school, I made sure I was there. And when I was there, I wasn't thinking about work. And when I was at work, I wasn't thinking about my kids. So it's really just like knowing where you need to be and be comfortable in your skin because of it. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's a great story. Congratulations on uh, everything you've done personally, everything uh, Bancroft has achieved. Um, we have a leadership development, a women's leadership development program uh, at NetSmart, and we may try to talk you into uh, <laughs> this procession uh, at some point. It's a great, great story. I'd love for, for all of our women leaders to hear it. So thank you for all your time today. It's been great. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. I really enjoyed it. At NetSmart, we understand the challenges facing provider organizations. Our team will help you navigate changing value-based care models with solutions and services that make person-centered care a reality. We'll equip you with technology and services that provide holistic, real-time views of care histories that inform better decision-making and better outcomes. Visit us today at ntst.com. NetSmart, serving you so you can serve others.
Thanks for listening to the NetSmart Care Threads podcast. Through collaboration and conversation, we can work together to make healthcare more connected than ever before and better support the communities we serve. To ensure you never miss an episode, please subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you use Apple Podcasts, we'd love for you to give us a quick rating for the show. Just tap the number of stars that you think the podcast deserves. Until next time.